Yeah, we're good. We good? Okay. Uh, today is Tuesday, January 17th. The time is 5.30 and I call this work session to order. We can start off with city updates from Ms. Solano. Thank you, Madam President, City Council, and Mayor Gratisar. I just have a few um, city updates this evening. And to start with a COVID update, uh, the, the number of um, positive case counts for the week was um, 54.2, which was, I'm sorry, 76.2, which was down from last week. The one-week positivity rate of 5.4, which is the same as last week. And then Pueblo County has the same 10 days stabilized um, hospitalizations from COVID. And just a reminder that next Monday, um, the Public County Health Director, Randy Evitz, will be here to give an update and answer any questions on, on other than COVID, some like the flu and RSV and any other questions that you have of him. He is going to take the city update time um, next Monday evening because it is televised. And from there, I, I would like to, and, and the office staff would, and, and uh, Councillor Martinez asked if, if you could help me facilitate the finalization this evening of the uh, city council work retreat. I think Alyssa sent out a doodle poll and received um, one, two, uh, three, four responses already. So there are a couple of you that haven't. Um, the the uh, Primary date so far is a Saturday, February the 18th and or later. Um, and Councillor uh, Winner suggested um, two nights during the week. Um, that would be a Tuesday and Wednesday night to begin from 5.30 and, and end an hour or two later. So if everyone else, if we could get, if you could facilitate and get to a, a good a date, we could start to let um, staff know, department directors, and then also begin to work on what agenda items you would like to um, include on that work session. Just to let you know, Ms. Lona, I'm, I'm gone from the 17th to the 25th, the 26th. <clears throat> How does the 18th work for everybody else? I know you responded. I'm not sure if you did, Mr. Tensio. Sarah responded to the 18th. I think I said yes. Dennis or Mr. Flores. Councilor Winner? You know, is, there, is, there, is anybody open for discussion to split that up? I don't think so. Because it's just, it's just a, it's a long time to sit. Yeah. I think yeah. uh, Councilor Martinez wanted to do it all in one day. So if everybody else is okay with yeah. that. Everybody else wants to do it all in one day. And the 18th works for everybody else. Thank you. Well, uh, notify uh, department directors and then we'll start to work on gathering through email um, your agenda uh, recommendations and suggestions and um convention center again i think it was it was open that's what they asked yes, Alyssa said uh, when she checked that the uh, convention center was open on saturday the 18th in the same room that um, it was held last year right thank you thank you and uh, then i just wanted to uh share that the state of the city written report is um on your space this evening it is also available to the community on the city's website at pueblo.us and the mayor will um, speak on the highlights of the State of the City report uh, next Monday at the City Council meeting because it is televised and it will either be part of the um, uh, uh, mayor's commentary or a work session item for a few minutes. So one of, one of those two, but it is available now. Uh, we'll, we'll be in compliance. The mayor will be with uh, the charter. It does require that the city uh, state of the city annually be presented for the formal record of the city by the first, um, uh, I think, the first day of February to the city clerk. And so, so that will be in advance. Um, and it, it is available now, but we will present it formally uh, to the city clerk's office in writing. So it is um, on the formal record before the first of February. Um, the next update is just simply ARPA, and there are ARPA updates tonight. The work session with respect to the 2022 um, a full year at a glance, and then uh, the balances moving forward into 2023, and then stopping to comment on two or three of the projects. You have in front of you the slide deck uh, of the PowerPoint uh, for the update this evening, and then you also have um, two um, spreadsheets of the full detail of uh, the report out of, of ARPA. We were thinking that um, you have an opportunity, we'll send those electronically as well. If there are ARPA projects that you would like more information on, or we need to add to the uh, work retreat agenda, just let us know so that there would be more information and more in depth than you received tonight. But um, um, Alex is here from the finance director's position to go through the numbers of where we are in 2022 and what's left over for ARPA into 2023. 
So that's the, the last of the um, ARPA updates for tonight. And that does conclude city updates for the evening. Do you have any questions or directions? Any questions for Ms. Solano, Councilor Flores? You know, I got a call today from someone that uh, uh, was concerned about, uh, he evidently owns a building on in the Union Avenue district and it's a historical building. But the gist of our conversation was that they did not feel that there was uniformity uh, as to how the rules about historical buildings, they were wanting to, to do some remodeling or they wanted to paint the outside. And I'm wondering whether or not we could get somebody from uh, the historical society. I, I don't know who has the, the power, I guess, to tell people what they can and cannot do for a building that has historical uh, designation through the state of Colorado. Well, there's a historical preservation committee is it, that and, deals with the Union Avenue structure specifically and have to approve any and all murals. And one of the things that will be coming before council at your next meeting is an appeal from the Historical Preservation Committee that uh, turned down a, a request or held that an individual is in violation. I don't know what billing you're talking about, but we have to be careful, I think, because you guys are going to be the decision makers in that process. And Mr. Kagosi can um, fill you in a little more on that. But my, my comment had not specifically on murals, but just everything. I mean, they control what kind of windows you can have, uh, what kind of, uh, whether or not you could even remove the stairs. I mean, there's just a lot of rules. And this gentleman was telling me he just wanted uniformity, that that everybody that has a building would be treated fairly, no matter, uh, you know, what building it is. And he had examples where uh, they would they would take one building and say it's okay here and it's not okay on another building for the same the same kind of thing and i and i i'm not i'm not giving this person any credibility until i find out for myself but it would be good to have them come uh, during a work session and maybe explain the process uh what what is their guidelines where's the rules to the how you play that game i guess uh and, and uh i i just like to see somebody from the uh historical preservation committee, whatever they're called, as to how they go about their business and what they can and cannot do. And I know the state has a lot of um, rules and regulations dealing with designation of historical buildings. This is by ordinance, I think, right? It's, you have no, we have history. code. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's included in one of our codes. Yeah, we have a, an historic preservation code that lays out the rules. Uh, people within that district have to apply for a certificate of appropriateness for certain buildings. The, the historic buildings are treated somewhat differently than those that were built later and, and approved prior to the historic district. Um, so, we the mayor's right. I, I think we should really have a work session and, and have uh, staff uh, explain to you what the rules are and what the process is. But I think that should occur after uh, our meeting on January 23rd. On the 23rd, you're going to hear an appeal. Uh, from a property owner who was de denied a certificate of appropriateness for uh, the uh, painting of, of a building. So you've got to keep an open mind and just decide. It, it's another quasi-judicial proceeding. You've got to keep an open mind, decide on the evidence. You cannot overturn the decision of the Historic Preservation Committee, but you can send it back to them uh, with guidance if you think that they proceeded uh, incorrectly. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I got the same phone call. Uh, I didn't get it from the person that has the appeal, but from a, a person that... Uh, other than himself, is saying the same thing that uh, 
everyone should be treated the same and they believe that then it's yeah. not happening. So well that's I, the intent. I'd like to the, the party to the appeal is a gentleman named Henry Barunda, Hank Barunda. Uh, and so you should really avoid discussing the case with him and or staff uh, before the hearing. I, I don't know the gentleman, so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Council Winner. Yeah, I can just add that um, things with the HPC have been kind of difficult at times as far as communication. I remember a case quite a few years ago that um, they were trying to say that the sign was the wrong font, that it needed to look more historical. So um, they said, well, do you have an example of fonts? And of course, they didn't have an example of fonts. And uh, then it came down to, well, we're not responsible for windows. We're just responsible if the structure is being changed. So I think there's a lot of miscommunication at times just within the HPC itself. So I can understand where this is coming from. Anybody else? Any other, any other questions for Ms. Lano? Okay. Um, then we will start off with the EPA Superfund site update. If we can have Beth Archer, EPA Community Involvement Coordinator, to the podium. Thank you, everyone. Um, I am going to share my screen and begin our presentation. Just one moment. And just to <clears throat> let folks know, uh, Sabrina here, I'll be presenting most of the slides. Janine Natterman with the state um, will join us around institutional controls um, later in the slide presentation. It looks like I'm not sharing my screen anymore, I don't think. What are, <clears throat> um, I'm seeing the city council chamber screen. Let me, sorry, everyone, let me try again. All right, are you able to view my screen? Yes, we can see it now. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Sabrina, over to you. All right, um, let's go ahead and move on to our um, second slide, our agenda. And um, we've got a couple of new faces on the team. I'd like um, them to, to um, just join real quick and give folks a wave if they can. Amanda Bartley, a new remedial project manager uh, who moved from Montana and Sydney Chan, who moved from uh, Atlanta Region 4. Um, so we're excited to have them on the team. Um, like I said, Janine's gonna be helping on the institutional controls topic. So I wanted to um, I wanted to talk a little bit about our residential area and updates around that. And the former smelter area, what we call operable unit two as well, and our, our what we've done in 2023 plans and, and forward. Um, a little bit around enforcement activities. Next slide, please. So for the residential area updates, um, folks may remember we've got about 1900 properties in that study area. Um, we've done a lot because we're getting close to the end uh, as we'll show you in a, here in a moment. Um, we've done a lot of community involvement around door to door, and um, last call to try to get as many folks signed up and giving us consent for sampling and cleanup as, as possible. We've also been collaborating with our state partners, um, other programs within EPA in the state of Colorado, as well as the local health department on a lead collaboration pilot project to help inform, continue to educate residents about other sources of lead in the community, like lead-based paint, since we have um, a, a huge percentage of the homes in our study area being built before 1978, the lead paint ban. Um, we were able to go back to hybrid meetings in August, so we're, we've been excited to be back down in the community. And because of COVID and some equipment um, recalls, the Pueblo Health Department was, wasn't able to do blood lead testing for a while, but they've been able to do that now again, and so they're reinvigorating their lead health program. Next slide, please. Um, continuing with the residential area update, 
Uh, similar to September 2021, we did a slight expansion, about half the sizes in 2021. And similarly, um, in your slide, you can see the green outline to the northwest and to the southwest. Those were areas that we added where we had cleanups right um, adjacent to that. And we'd like to see a clean margin around the area. Um, and and we want to be able to limit um, you know, how much we're we're moving out and what seems reasonable for what would have come out of the stack from Colorado Smelter that was formerly down on the Benedict Park property. Um, and so this is just part of our normal due diligence that we're doing. I'll talk a little bit more about upcoming work that's going to help us really rifle in on this boundary so that we can finalize that. Next slide, please. Um, and that gets us to our 2023 plans around air dispersion modeling. Um, I have tasked a, a contractor to help us identify the hopeful maximum distance that smelters would have been released from the 200 foot main stack and affected the neighborhoods around the, Colorado, the former Colorado smelter. Um, so that's something that we're hoping to kick off here pretty quickly. And we're also doing an updated background study, which is in this map, the red dots um, that are outside the pink buffer. And that pink buffer was placed so that we wouldn't be sampling areas that may have other metals contamination from other industrial sources. But we want to look at what is sort of a normal urban lead level for Pueblo, and that'll help us to update our background study. Um, the first background study we did was in 2018. Next slide, please. Um, we've been continuing to march forward with the sampling and cleanups. This slide shows where we were in 2021, late 2021 and, now, and late 2022. So we're about 99% done with our soil sampling and about 76% done with the dust sampling. Um, that lag there is primarily because of the um, time during COVID when we couldn't go into homes. On the residential cleanup side, we are about 88% with our done with our soil cleanups and about 61% done with the dust cleanups. Um, a big effort has been residential last call. We've been talking about it for a little while, but because we're so close on um, getting done. And, and the idea is that we want to be done with cleanups by the end of 2023 for soil. Um, our dust cleanups could go into early 2024. Um, we're really trying to touch as many people as we can in the community with our message around um, the importance of getting their properties sampled. And if they need to get cleaned up, try to get that done. So we are going to continue more social media, email updates, um, get boots on the ground and do more door-to-door -door work, um, city cable channel advertising, and then some things that are in the planning are more media interviews and some op-eds, a TV spot, formal letters, um, perhaps a, a follow-up telephone town hall that was really successful the last time that we did that with the mayor. Um, and that was uh, really helpful. And then our, our normal um, press releases, social media, email, and website updates. Next, please. So for operable unit two, for folks that may not be aware, um, we often call the former smelter area, this green area that's in the middle that is bisected by I-25 and the active Union Pacific Rail Line through there. But we've also included the undeveloped areas around Runyon Lake and several of the residential areas have some undeveloped areas around them too. So those have been wrapped into the undeveloped portion of operable unit two. And so we've got um, a lot of work planned. We've done a lot of uh, surface soil sampling, but we've got some more data collection around um, soil and sediments and a lot of biota. So mammals, fish and um, bugs and vegetation. So that's what's in the work for 2023. Um, that'll help us fill data gaps around uh, how those organisms or if they're affected by the smelter contamination. And then another big piece um, around this is reuse planning. 
the former Colorado Smelter Revitalization Project, now called BEGIN, um, that was really focused around the early days and operable unit one, but we're looking at operable unit two areas as well, and we're dusting off some 2019 um, documents and trying to get back to that for operable unit two reuse planning. Next slide, please. Other pieces here, this map just nicely shows that the pale yellow are areas where we have completed um, some sampling. We do have more to do in those pale areas. Um, we had earlier done some shallow soil sampling to about two feet below ground surface. Now we've got several areas throughout the community where we would like to do deeper boreholes and um, try to, to characterize deeper uh, what might be smelter related, and then when do we get to native soils, uh, non smelter related areas as well. It's difficult to see, but on the south area of Runyon Lake, there's some black hashing um, right before the um, new year, we were able to complete some sampling on 46 of those areas south of the lake, and we're going to continue working on that this year. Next slide, please. Let's see here. I think the next one we've got is our, our timeline. And um, this is somewhat updated based on the fact that we were able to move our operable unit two activities up two years uh, after getting the bill funding that helped us uh, do that. And so we've got um, a lot of the sampling that I mentioned um, that we are planning to do, as well as the, the, um, the reports that come out of that and that those won't start to be developed until 2025 potentially. And we will finalize our remedial investigation report and a feasibility study. Um, we'll be working closely with community members so that they know what we've been up to along the way. And they know what the possible alternatives are for cleanup, uh, where cleanups are needed. And those will come out in a proposed plan. So hopefully um, we can stick to this timeline, but. Um, you know, some time will tell if we're able to stick with that. Another important piece of what's been going on are just our standard uh, working through liability issues. It's just part of the Superfund process and working with the, the current property owners in that main central area of operable unit to um, prospective purchasers or renters. And then um, also working with Black Hills Energy recently to get consent to one of their properties that's um, up in the blocks area. That's one of the undeveloped areas that we'd like to get characterized for the ecological risk assessment. And then we're also working closely with Union Pacific Railway so that they can complete sampling of their 100 foot right of way um, as it goes through the site north to south on the west side of operable unit two. And then when we get that data, our folks will take a look at worker exposures, ecological risk, um, whether or not there's the potential for contaminant migration off of the site uh, from that area as well. Um, another a, a big, big part of what we've been working toward, Janine's going to um, talk with you about next, the institutional controls. Yeah, exactly. So institutional controls. We've been working with the city for five or six years on a draft plan or a draft, um, you know, we'll call it a draft plan. Um, and we have achieved one. We've got con concurrence with the <clears throat> mayor and the city's planning department on it. However, we won't be able to finalize it and present it to the public for a public process until we have the site boundary finalized. And a lot of what uh, Sabrina just talked about has to feed into that, making sure that we have um, a good boundary of the, the area. So that's why we still talk about it as a study area instead of a super fun site. Um, so basically, just as background, an institutional control are, is, is an administrative or legal control that helps minimize potential for human exposure to contamination or and or protect the integrity of the remedy. Um, in this case, what we will be talking about is an overlay of the entire study area. What's the study area right now? And that seems like a very large area to have a, an ordinance in place to um, that this would affect. But in reality, uh, we anticipate that it will apply to only five to 10 properties per year maximum, and only if they are going to have a large construction project, which would be impacted. 
So that would mean um, construction, they want to dig a very deep hole down to depth where perhaps there is uh, some still some lead or arsenic contamination it would be, have to be handled differently than just any old dirt. Um, this does not circumvent the normal city permitting process for construction projects. Rather, it uh, works hand in hand together. Um, so that's basically it. When we can get the boundary finalized, then we will move forward with the public process, the city's public process, working with you guys <clears throat> to get a, to uh, to the public process and get everything finalized. Thanks, Sabrina. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think our last slide here is uh, our contacts, our new contact information. Um, just to fill folks in a little bit more, Sydney Chan has a lot of a lead experience that she brings from Region 4, and Amanda um, is going to be heading up the operable unit to um, pieces of things. So we've got their phone number here as well. <clears throat> Thank you. Is there any questions for Ms. Forrest or Ms. Archer? Councilor Martinez Ortega. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> yeah, Sabrina, or I guess whomever wants to answer this. Um, when you say you're 99% done with soil testing, does that mean that you're 99% done with all the soil testing for all residential homes? Is is that how you categorize? Yeah, that's that's what we're getting close to. So there's um, there's a couple of different ways that we look at it and. This is sort of the number based on what's inside the, the dashed area, including those, those little green um, outlines that we added to the study area last September. And I think the, the total number of properties, um, and, and it, it's, it's always somewhat in flux because some of these properties have more than one home on them. There might be a, a main home and then a rental, or there could be uh, a couple different um, multifamily sorts of homes on that. But yes, that's that's the hope. Um, there's more room in our contracting if we do need to to do additional sampling beyond what we think is that study area. That's why it's really important with the background study as well as this air dispersion modeling. Um, I'm hoping that those two things will help us really refine that study area and and get it to the point where we can call it. You know, this is the maximal distance where we think Colorado smelter drop out, drop out from that stack would have affected the neighborhood so that we don't continue to expand the site study area. Great, thanks for answering that. And of those 99% that have been tested, um, what's the number that actually need, still need uh, uh, the remediation of the soil and dust? I have the, well, the overall number. So earlier on when we were much closer um, to the smelter itself and hadn't cleaned so many properties. It was closer to 50% of the properties looked like they needed a soil cleanup and we're at about 45, 46% of properties needing soil cleanups at this point. Um, so right now, you know, it's just, um, you know, a, a property or so a week seems to turn up as we're getting out to the margins we, because we've done so much sampling um, already and, and have completed the vast majority of those cleanups. Part of our, our concern though, is we've still got folks that are refusing. Maybe they gave us consent to do the sampling and might need a cleanup, but they're not allowing us to do the cleanup. And we, you know, we still are considering this a voluntary process, um, but we're really trying to use the health education and outreach approach to let them know why it's really important for them to give us consent and for us to, to make sure that, that we can get this work done. Um, you know, anecdotally, we have information that says that folks might have trouble down the road uh, with real estate financing or selling a property if they haven't had the sampling. Um, and our institutional control uh, piece is really only going to be focused on the soil cleanups. It's not, it's not, um, doesn't, our ordinance doesn't have anything to do with indoor dust cleanups at all. Um, but lenders seem to be really narrowing in and wanting to make sure that they, they know whether a home has, ha has been sampled or needs a cleanup. Thank you. Um, and I believe that number of the folks who didn't, who read, who agreed to the testing, but refused the, the soil cleanup was 
in the 70s or 80s, about six months ago. Um, do you have that number now? Has that come down significantly? Or what help needs to, is there any help that uh, we can lend from the city council um, to get getting those folks yards cleaned up? Yeah, I think, so I think we had just under 50 and we might, Beth, you might have to, to jog memory here. It might be just under 80 now. Um, but I think this is where all of those different outreach methods that we're looking at are, are you know, what we're, we're looking at. I'm getting a message from my computer that my software center is about to uh, reboot me. Um, so hopefully I won't get, <laughs> get dropped off of here. Um, but one of the things I just wanted to say is, um, you know, we've looked at different ways that perhaps you or the mayor might be able to help us um, in the district with letters to folks um, that come from you, perhaps, that might allow folks to, you know, to, to get this work done if, if that's um, something that would help them kind of get off center and give us consent to do this work. I remember you asking me for a letter of support to some of those homeowners, and I don't think that a letter being sent to them is enough. I think that um, going and knocking on some of those doors and having a conversation with those homeowners in their in their area, I'd be willing to help with that. But I'm not um, the expert on soil, lead, contamination, and the cleanup area of that. But um, so you all would have to help um, with some logging some hours in if we're going around to some of those. And that offer still stands. I I won't write a letter of support because I don't think that will do much, um, but I would be willing to go out with the EPA or the PDHPE, CDHPE to go out and knock on those doors and have conversations with those, either the 50 or the below 80 number of that's there still Great. in the super fund. So Great. let me know. Yeah, I think that's that's ideal. I think we have identified that, that boots on the ground is is the most effective. One point, um, so Vicente, I was able to pull up the uh, sam um, sorry, the refusals. So for dust, we have about 150. And then for soil sampling, we have approximately 60. And I did wanna highlight, we are still doing our door-to-door -door outreach where we go and we knock on doors and we ask people to give us consent. We have started to fade off with some of these properties that have refused like three to five times or we've had direct conversations with them and they're really not changing their mind. So that's something I'd love to talk with you more, maybe offline, how we can plan something like that. Cause I do think that having a familiar face from the city council could be more effective than having some EPA and CDPHE and PDPHE folks, but that's just something to keep an awareness of. Thank you. I agree. Let's set that up. Thank you. Mayor, did you have something? I think it's important for everybody to understand what these institutional controls are. It's going to be an ordinance that will be presented to city council and it'll be passed. It'll basically say that if you want to get a, get a building permit in this zoned area, um, you've got to go through an extra step. If your property has been tested and rehabilitated, that's probably going to be the end of it for you. You'll be able to get a building permit for whatever you want to do. If your property hasn't been tested or if it's been tested and hasn't been remediated, then the burden is going to be on the homeowner to get the property tested or the burden is going to be on the homeowner to get this property remediated. That's why it's so important for us as a community to communicate to these property owners that you're going to cause yourself a lot of heartache and a lot of heartburn if you don't get your property tested and you don't get it remediated. Why not get it done now while the EPA is there? And this process will be um, run out of planning and zoning. We're working on getting the databases together for all the properties that will be in this, um, this zone uh, once obviously the boundaries are determined and they haven't been yet, but that's why it's so important. That's why we did the town hall. We called every telephone number in that area and invited them to participate in the town hall so we could talk to them about this is what's coming down the road, these institutional controls and uh, get your property tested, get your property remediated. It costs the individuals nothing to have that done and it will save them a lot of problems in the future. That'll be very expensive to get that testing done and to get that remediation done in the future if it's not done now while the EPA is in town. 
Councilor Flores. Uh, Mayor, does that include, uh, it, are there any uh, roadblocks to them selling the property as a result of the ordinance you're gonna be presenting to us? There's not gonna be any roadblocks to selling, I don't think. I, it, it, the title will reflect that it's in this zone. And so it, to that extent, there will be some restrictions on the use of the property. If you wanna pull a building permit, you have to jump through these hoops. If you haven't had your property tested, and you haven't had your property remediated, it's going to be more expensive for a prospective purchaser to pull a building permit. So that will have an effect on that property, which is why I say get it done now so that um, we'll have a record that the property has been tested and it's been remediated. It's tested and there, no contamination was found or it's been tested and the contamination was remediated. We'll have that database in the planning department and we'll be able to clear up that confusion for any prospective purchaser. But if the property hasn't been tested or it hasn't been remediated, if it's been found to be contaminated, that's going to create a problem for the property owner. So that's why I say it's so important to get it done now. I had a couple of questions for uh, the EPA uh, individuals. The, I think I heard you say that you were going to be doing ecological uh, studies on uh, certain areas, including Runyon Lake. Is that correct? Yeah, so there are several of those natural areas around Runyon Lake and Fountain Lake. Um, and we've actually, we got Colorado Parks and Wildlife Assistance in November for some of the upstream sampling. So kind of a, a reference location, um, a ways upstream. And then we'll be looking at some of the, the ponds itself and the Arkansas River as it flows by for fish tissue and bugs, mammal, small mammals um, that are in, in the area um, and, and plant species that those animals utilize. You know, it's still a very popular fishing spot for people. And I'm assuming that uh, you will also sample the condition, I guess, of the fish in that area. I, I don't, I'm, I'm not a fisherman, but I'm assuming that people that catch fish may eat some of these fish. And uh, uh, it would be interesting to find out, you know, whether or not the fish are contaminated. So uh, it, it will be exhaustive and extensive, your testing, right, that will be able to dictate that? Yes. Right. Okay, uh, that answers that question. My other question is a much broader question, and that has to do with all of the federal legislation that's occurring, uh, has anybody in EPA analyzed uh, how a community like Pueblo could utilize uh, uh, some of these programs and money that will be coming to cities as a result of uh, all of these, the infrastructure bill and uh, all of the other bills that have passed? Uh, I, I know that you're limited to cleanup but has anyone looked at the potential of, of opportunities for the city of Pueblo that we could access as a result of your cleanup site, as a result of these, uh, these new federal laws? Sure. Um, you know, the, the um, various funds that, that we know about, we try to, and as grant opportunities come around and different funding types come around, we try to share that with uh, the local stakeholders and very often it's the local health department that we're working with and the folks from that department or the community advisory group folks that are involved in the reuse um, programs and and uh, the different planning that they're doing so we always try to keep our eyes open the other piece too that's really important with this administration and different funding is um, communities that have environmental justice concerns and what funding opportunities are there potentially out there for those groups. So the lead collaboration, um, our former, one of our former community involvement coordinators, Jen Harrison, helps work with that. And she helps to convene all the different federal and state programs and different agencies to help identify possible resource types um, that can help communities. And there's there's one in particular that PDPHE plans to apply for uh, called Government to Government. Um, that's an EJ specific one. Janine or Beth, do you have anything else um, that you can highlight? 
I think that's the main highlight you covered at Sabrina. We have our email list where we distribute information on EPA specific um, funding opportunities. But I think when it comes to the infrastructure and bill funding, we don't have a, a, we haven't really done a specific analysis on what may be available. But I know that Pueblo is a community where we're looking for what opportunities we can share, and we use that um, CAG list to dis distribute that information. Thank you. Councilor Maestri, did you ask something? Yes. Um, how are we assuring um, that the title is being, where, where, are we, where is it logged that the, that the property has been tested and remediated? Because in future sales of the property, when the purchaser is, they'll know that that was in this, I mean, super fund area, but where is it logged that they can go and research that before they complete a purchase? It'll be lodged in planning and zoning. Typically, when someone comes in, they get a certificate of zoning mm -hmm. when they purchase a property, and that's where it'll be lodged there. That's where that database will be, and that's where it will, that's where that certificate comes from. Mm -hmm. That's where the determination will be made. Will there be something where title can pick that up in the title work also? Will title be able to bring that to the attention of the buyer through the title work. Um, yeah, like it's, if it's a cash deal or something. Well, right. You know, the title pick, picks up liens and so forth on the property. Or what do we, are we placing anything? We have, you know. We're not recording any documents in the public records, no. Okay. That was discussed about if your property has been tested, then let's record a letter or something like that. But we've moved to a different system at this point. So um, it's got to be full disclosure by the by the seller, I would I would say. Correct. Right. It would have to be full disclosure by the seller. OK. Yeah, because I, I mean, somebody buying a property and there's an added expense to that, that's really, you know, not fair to the buyer. And it would be nice if there was some, if we did have a matter of record somewhere mm -hmm. that title could refer back to, or it can be on the assessor's records or, or something when, when a person is making a purchase. They shouldn't have to go through an investigative process yeah. for that. Well, there's concerned. all kinds of different buyers, you know, all kinds of different buyers. Some are happy to buy a pig in a poke, depending on what the price is, and they'll take it and they'll deal with whatever problems there are that might arise later. Uh, others will want to be much more diligent and before they close, they'll want to get that certificate of zoning and make sure uh, what the requirements are with respect to that. But if, they're, if they do their diligence and the buyer in that process, that certificate of zoning will reflect what status of this property is vis-a-vis -vis this institutional control ordinance. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. It seems like it should be um, recorded in the assessor's office. Otherwise, if you look way down the line, it's just a potential of, of blight and people foreclosing. Um, but also, I had a question for the EPA. If, if somebody has their outside dirt analyzed and that was negative or under a certain margin, why is it necessary to do inside? I've had a question uh, like that from a constituent. Sure, sure. So a lot of times there can still be track in or blow in from those sources. Um, but admittedly, sometimes when we see higher lead levels, it can be from deteriorated older lead based paint layers. Um, and we really haven't tried to differentiate and tease out. If we see something elevated, we've just been trying to clean up and do mass dust removal as part of those cleanups. Um, and it's it's unique to Colorado Smelter across the nation. There aren't very many Superfund sites where indoor cleanups have taken place. Um, but we did note that we were seeing really high levels of lead early in our studies. And because that can be um, a, a really acute source of contamination, especially to women of childbearing age or young ones under seven. We wanted to, to use as much of our, our Superfund regulatory authority to clean up as much of the community as we could. 
Okay, thanks. But um, you're saying that the um, the federal government or the EPA won't pay to clean up the inside, or the if it, there's no, we, a we have we have been yes. We'll do interior yep. cleanup. Yep, we've been doing well, interior. How many homes have you done that on? Um, we have done it on. See, we've got 635 sort of estimated. We've gotten close to about. We've done it on 404 properties. And they're just removing all the lead paint and abatement. So, no, no, I this is no, it's not, it's, it's yeah, not ahead, lead sorry. abatement. It's just mass dust removal. So we don't have the authority to well, do that. Well, I could use that at my abatement. house, some massive dust removal. Pardon? <laughs> I said I could use that at my house, some massive dust massive removal. Massive dust removal, Absolutely. yeah. So we, we've worked closely with the local health department, and they did have a housing, housing and urban development lead abatement grant for a time, um, but it wasn't entirely successful because the today's costs to do things like paint removal, window replacements, yeah. doors were much more costly than what yeah, the really grant allowed. Yeah, Pardon? that's really expensive. No, it's just really expensive to abate lead paint. So it's that very was expensive. Perfect. So a big, a big part of what we're trying to do is continue the education and outreach around other sources of lead and home maintenance, changing uh, furnace filters out to minimize lead in the home. Sure, sure. Hey, thanks. Sure, thank you. Yeah. Sabrina, I wanted to talk with you about OU2 for just a second. It looks like the timeline that was presented there, we're talking 26 or 27 before any redevelopment would be possible there. And we've got a situation in Pueblo now where Black Hills Energy is looking for a place for a substation in Bessemer. And it seems to me that OU2 might be a great place for that. I mean, I can't imagine a better use for a contaminated piece of property than to put a substation. And I'm wondering, has that been brought to your attention? Is there any way we could light a fire under this to see if how that could be explored? Sure. I think, I think it's always great to explore those things. And um, I think that some of these processes can be done in parallel. Um, a lot of times, you know, if we're able to still do our studies, but then things, because this could be a possible reuse, um, I think that it's definitely worth conversation and, and pursuing. And are you the person we should have that conversation with? Me and Amanda. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy New Year, all. You, you as well. Next, we have an ARPA presentation from the Santa de Cristo Arts Center School of Dance, Mr. Andy Sanchez and Ms. Nan Wainwright. Hello, Madam President, City Council members, thank you very much for having us here tonight. We're here to present tonight our ARPA grant request and answer any questions that you may have. And uh, just to start off, I think a, a lot of what we've presented in terms of the ARPA request pivots on the fact that children in the arts, especially in a community like ours that may be underserved, tend to do better with the arts in all aspects of their life. I'm an example of that. And I think that uh, there's probably some other members in the room who are uh, examples of that as well. I'd also say too that I, I have two young uh, sons and one of the sons that I have uh, through dance has really found a whole other aspect in terms of what he's able to do even relating to his academic success. So what we'll do is uh, we'll present a little bit of background and also uh, some detail in regard to the request. And I'm happy to have with me tonight, I serve as interim CEO at the Arts Center and I should have said my name, I apologize, Andy Sanchez. Uh, and with me tonight is Nan Wainwright, who's the director of the School of Dance at the Arts Center. And I'll go ahead and hand off to Nan, thank you. Thank you all, and thanks for the opportunity to present to you this evening. Um, I wanted to just walk you through uh, the phases of the program. Um, 
and uh, then we'll take questions, I guess, just kind of organically. Um, do, do you all have a copy of the subrecipient agreement? Um, no, oh, oh, okay, okay. Um, well, let me just explain then kind of organically where we're going with this. Um, this would be a program uh, where we would start by um, reaching out to children in, um, in schools, um, in underserved areas of the community, and also in community organizations. Um, part of this um, was inspired by the fact that we had a very successful um, um, interaction um, with the, the children from Boys and Girls Club. Uh, last summer when they came for for tours um, and um, a lot of enthusiasm from the kids to be um, in the School of Dance um, at the Art Center, um, able to you know, use our facilities and um, just kind of get their eyes opened as to what was there and available to them. And what was a little heartbreaking is some of the comments from the children saying, you know, I would love to come and take dance lessons, but I don't think my mom knows where this place is and things like that. So we're just trying to find a way um, to uh, to help these children avail themselves of, of what is available to them in the community um, and with your help. Uh, the first phase would be uh, to send uh, dancers out to schools and community centers. Um, they would do a presentation that would be a short performance as well as some improvisational exercises um, and some warm up exercises um, with the children. Um, and then the children would do a little choreographic exercise. We would then have the opportunity to um, introduce these children to their opportunity um, in the next phase of the program to come and actually study dance at the School of Dance at the Art Center. Um, this uh, would culminate um, probably in the um, late summer, early fall with um, tours um, and a performance at the Art Center to kick off a program in, in fall of 2023, um, where we would have an intro to ballet class that would be taught uh, for eight weeks, the children would have the opportunity then to perform in the Nutcracker um, at the end of their session um, as kind of an, an, an inspiration. And then we would hope that those children would then um, continue um, their matriculation at the School of Dance in the following spring, starting in, in Ballet One. Um, and this would all be um, scholarships according to the subrecipient agreement. Um, we would then repeat the same process while those that the first class of children are in their classes in the spring, um, they, the, we would start recruiting the second year's class um, in the spring of 2024, um, go through the same process. And then, then in fall of 2024, they would enter um, as the next um, intro to ballet class um, with the same opportunity to be in the Nutcracker. And then we would um, send them into ballet one. So, and we, this uh, program would be scheduled to start um, this spring if funding is approved and, um, and continue through December of 2025. So we would have three classes. And then by the end of that third class, um, we would have worked on scholarship funding so that that third class could then go in. Um, and that hopefully then at that point, it, it's a going concern. Um, and we've been able to just establish this program on a yearly basis. Um, if, I, if I may add to, I think the last time I, I was here in front of council, it was to uh, not only thank council for everything that you do for the Arts Center, but also it was at our uh, time period last year where we had our coming home celebration. The whole purpose of that celebration was to reaffirm to the city and county of Pueblo where the Art Center started and what the Art Center was about when it started. And I'll just say a little bit about that. The context of the Art Center is it was begun as a regional art center. And the idea at that time, and we think back to Kathy Farley and Pat Kelly and other supporters at that time, was for the Art Center to be able to do the very things that we're talking about. At times in our history, many have stated that at times that we've maybe strayed away from the concept of making sure that we're available to all. So what we're looking to do is get back to our roots. A part of that, as uh, Nan mentioned, is the fact that our outreach, even with Boys and Girls Club and other groups in Pueblo, we take it very seriously, the, uh, the mantle that the Art Center holds and what we need to be doing. So with your support tonight, that does help us uh, a bit more in that direction. And, uh, and again, I just want you all to know that we take it very seriously and we take our mission seriously. Thank you. Mayor. 
I don't know whether it was stated or not, the amount requested and the amount we're recommending is $50,000 for this three-year period. So we think that's a really good program for that amount of money and for that investment. We'll plan to use ARPA funds for that. And um, Did you say there was already a sub-recipient agreement written up? Or is that typical? There is. We, we have it drafted. Case? And if, you know, we wanted to do this presentation before we send the um, sub-recipient agreement to council. Yeah. I mean, we've, we're recommending that the Arts Center be funded. So we prepare the agreement and it's drafted, prepared for the, Jan I think, the 23rd. No, not for the 23rd, but for later, depending on what council's reaction is. And how many students will this be helping? You foresee. So um, we would foresee that the first class would be around 30 students. Um, that That's not um, including the kids that would um, be the recipients of the in-school um, performances. Um, those, um, if we did four of them, for example, in the spring, that would be about 120 kids probably. Um, and then out of those, the, I, I'm estimated that the students that would be able to travel to the art center for the programs would be about 30 for that fall program um, per year. Um, and then uh, we would then make room for those kids in, in the regular classes. Any questions from Council, Councilor Forrest? Just to clarify, you're asking for 50,000 for three years. So is that 16, six per year uh, to, to, in order to uh, encompass the three years? I just wanna be correct on that. So um, in, in our um, original proposal, I laid out the budget in terms of phases. Um, the, the early phase isn't um, nearly as expensive as, um, as the others. And, and um, so, you know, sending the dancers out to the schools is a minimal cost um, compared to bringing the students in for class at the Art Center. And by and large, our largest, um, our largest ticket item on here would be transportation. So the 50,000 does, whether it's divided that way or not, is going to take care of the three years. Yes. Okay, thank you. Any other Councilor Tensio? Hi. Uh, this basically, I'll talk for uh, Andy. Uh, he and I had a conversation one evening at um, one of the- um, It's a Festival Fridays. Festival Fridays. And I've been a supporter of the Art Center and the Arts basically all my life. And I am I, I am where I am today because of the arts, basically. So, uh, but being a supporter, I'm also one of the biggest critics of the Arts Center. And we talked and I said, uh, one of the reasons that I am a critic of the Arts Center is that uh, moderate to low income kids don't get a chance to go there. Also, uh, my argument is that if we want a good, strong, viable dance school, it has to have numbers. And the numbers aren't in the upper classes. The numbers are in, in the uh, middle to lower classes. That's where uh, most of the kids are. And there's a, there's a boatload of talent out there. And uh, uh, so uh, Andy and I have talked and he came up with the with the program, and I think it's a great program. Uh, full disclosure, though, do you mind saying who might just teach that class? Well, the right person for the job is Councilman Atencio. Yeah, I volunteered to to teach that class. Uh, so, uh, you, first of all, you got to put that dance studio together, correct? Um, we would. Um, we can do it with the existing facilities um, right now. Um, okay. uh, we would just schedule it in to our fall schedule. Yeah, so I, I volunteered to, uh, to, to teach that class and I'm, I'm gonna be happy to do so. I've been out of dance for a long time, but uh, I think I could teach a, a beginning class without a whole lot of trouble. Well, and uh, many of you may know, um, Councilman Atencio actually had his own ballet school I did, at yeah. one time. So he's um, very well qualified to. <laughs> uh, I, I, since I am connected to the program, uh, Mr. Kogosik, I assume that I will not be able to vote on this. I, I would suggest that, that you recuse. Yes. Um, we, we wanted to get council's go ahead before we put this on the agenda. So um, 
the agreement, uh, I think, has been approved by the Arts Center and, and by me. It's ready to go and will be on the agenda February 13th, uh, second reading two weeks later. And that fits your timetable, I think, as far as funding is concerned. Yes, it would. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really excited because not only will I be able to teach the class, but we agreed that I might be able to choreograph the kids in that class to fit within the, uh, within the um, Nutcracker. So it's going to be great. And I, I should note for the record that the mayor also appeared in the uh, Nutcracker and uh, did quite well. Council Warner. Yeah, what, what is that um, What is that role in the Nutcracker Mother or what? In fact, uh, council, uh, Councilwoman uh, uh, Winner, you were also. I was, yeah. I Mother felt Ginger like a drag Nutcracker. queen, actually, by the time they got done with me. <laughs> because Mother Ginger. How did you feel? <laughs> you feel the same way? <laughs> the, mayor had a, the mayor had a different role. For sure. <laughs> oh, oh, I guess so. <laughs> so, uh, Larry, this is uh, this is uh, classical ballet. Yeah. Can you give us a demo of Releve Plie Releve Sing? Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Councilor Maestri. So, do all children qualify for the program, or is it just is it just the what would be the cost for a child that uh, didn't qualify for a scholarship? Um, we had discussed um, charging an, a nominal fee, uh, $35 for the eight-week session, um, just to start, um, you know, if if there were somebody who didn't qualify who wanted to be a part of it, um, uh, just, you know, to do that intro to ballet uh, class. We also have scholarships available through the School of Dance as well, um, through the Art Center. Um, so anybody who was just signing up outside of this program um, would have the opportunity to apply uh, for a scholarship as well. Are they part of the same classes and so forth? No. They they would be integrated into the classes. So they would start out with this intro class um, just to kind of get um, their feet wet, so to speak, right? And mm -hmm. and feel like they um, they were established and knew a little bit about dance before they went into um, the the already established classes. And then starting in uh, the springtime, they would just be filtered into the classes. Um, they. Uh, would probably most likely stay with their classmates uh, just for transportation purposes, um, because that would be the most convenient thing is to make sure that we were able to schedule those classes in a way that they could. And um, hopefully those recipients would then fill up the classes. We have limited space, you know, um, uh, you don't want to put, you know, 30 kids all necessarily in the same room at the same time, depending on which studio um, you're in. So. so through the School of Dance, what is the cost for children to attend the School of Dance already we, in place? Because this is a program that you're in the you just, you created this pro, you're creating this program under the this um, grant. Yes, and I mean it, it's an an expansion of our programming, I guess, in a sense, rather than you know completely uh, new programming. They would be doing the same kinds of things. But uh, get to get back to your question about the cost for the students at the School of Dance, mm -hmm. um, we have a sliding scale. Um, our our classes start um, at ten dollars per hour, and then the students, um, the more hours they take, um, the less expensive each hourly rate becomes. Just because if you have a student um, taking twenty hours of classes, and this does happen frequently, it would become incredibly expensive for them, you know, to okay. have to do that. So um, we do have individual um, uh, caps and and family uh, rates also for for families who are heavily involved in the school. And then on top of that, membership discounts and um, scholarships. Okay, thank you. Councilor Flores, did you have something? Yes. Oh. Yes. Councilor Tinsville. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, emphasize that the demographic that we're going after these kids, like Nan said, their parents don't even know where the art center is, much less wanting to go there. So this intro class for this group of kids is really going to be important because what we want to do is introduce them to what it could be. They'll be able to, when they get into the, the, um, the regular school, they'll be able to, to participate. I'll get them ready to 
to go into, and they'll be full-fledged students at that time. So uh, we're dealing with, uh, un unfortunately, they don't get the same opportunities that the upper classes have. U upper class people get to take their kids to, to dance recitals, and they get to take them to nutcrackers, and they take them to performances. Uh, people on the lower end of the economic ladder don't get to do that. So by introducing them in a little bit different way, uh, we, we elevate them to the norm, so to speak. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's basically what I'm thinking anyway, uh, but we're, we're kind of thinking the same thing. Yeah, yeah, Larry, you've been asking for this forever, 16 years. So I'm glad it's finally, Finally, because, you know, you and I complain all the time that cash is not actually getting to the people that need it. And um, it's true. You've been yeah. very, very patient. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, like I said, I've not only been the big, one of the biggest supporters of the Art Center, but I've been one of the biggest critics. And th this is happening. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you guys for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, moving on to Parks and Rec program revenues. Mike Sixton and Tamara Moore. Madam President, as they come forward, um, I think Councilor uh, Flores asked uh, last week uh, for some information on the Parks and Recreation um, programs, the, the fees for student participation, adult participation, and the related expenses. And kudos to Parks and Rec. They got it together between last Monday and this evening uh, to present. So the, the slide deck's ready. And also, um, Alex is back up with any of the finance questions. Great team. And um, Stephen Meyer wasn't um, able to attend tonight. He has had a scheduled vacation. He's on the beach somewhere. So... We don't feel sorry for him, do we? Um, again, this is Tamara Moore. She's a recreation supervisor. I'm Michael Sexton. I'm the assistant director. We're here to kind of go over our various sports and recreation program fees. Um, you know, we do few sports, adult sports. We have some, a lot of drop-in programs. And you'll see kind of a common theme. Can we bring that up? You'll see a common theme in our presentation um, with our youth sports programs that uh, no child is, is ever turned away. We do offer scholarships and um, go ahead, yeah. Our first uh, program we just wanna give you a little report on is is our youth uh, sports basketball program. We have two levels. We have a recreational level, uh, which consists of two different uh, non-competitive programs, our little dribblers, which is the kind of the beginning stage, the little tiny ones. If you've never been to a little dribblers basketball game or a t-ball game, they're very entertaining. So I, I suggest you go. Um, and then our junior hoopsters, which is the next level up, and if you look at our competitive level, it's we don't have as many numbers in, in that program, but that is a competitive uh, club team tournament um, program. I think right now our only uh, level we have is the seventh and eighth grade program. Those are the only ones that have signed up for this program. We've had a total of 566 uh, participants this last year. Our next um, program is our recreational, again, recreational level flag football program with our youth. Again, no child is ever turned away and we do have scholarships available. Again, we do start from the little tykes, four-year-olds, and we go all, all the way up. We added a 10 and 11-year-old division this last year. Again, the program fee is the same as the basketball for the, the entry level uh, recreation, which is $55. And we had over 200 participants in our flag football this last fall. We have a tennis instruction program. Uh, we have three levels. We have the peewee, again, the four-year-olds up to six. Uh, that fee is $48. And we do the future stars, which is the next level up, which is $48. And then the aces is the more advanced kids who want to start uh, working on their games so they can play high school and hopefully go further than that. Our T-ball program is one of our most successful programs, our most popular programs. Again, 
Uh, we don't turn children away on this one either. And again, we start at the very young ages. Uh, that happens to be my granddaughter right there. She's a she was our shortstop this last year. Uh, 55 again is our entry level uh, program fee. Again, 468 participants this last year. We had a new program this last year called Coach Pitch. Uh, it took the place of of a, uh, co a pitching machine program we used to have. And those ages for that was nine to 11. Again, it was recreational and we did co-ed. Again, a five, $55 program fee. And for a first year, 58 participants, we feel is a very good uh, showing. Some of you might, might remember years and years ago, we had slab uh, basketball program. Well, we're trying to bring it back. It's been slow going, but we, the numbers are getting better every year. Uh, it's a three on three program. For youth right now, again, no child has ever turned away. We do have scholarships available, and this is grades five through 10. Uh, we can't offer a little tight program because the baskets are too high, um, unfortunately, but uh, we're looking at maybe doing some upgrades to that facility in the future. Maybe we'll have baskets that we can lower to get that age group involved as well. Again, that's a $55 program fee, and we had 149 participants this last summer. We do have a free program uh, at uh, Ray Aguilera Park at the Joe Santos Field, ages 7 to 14. Uh, that program was started uh, many years ago by Ray. Uh, Ray wanted something to take over uh, when all the old timers baseball association folded. So we, we created this program and made it a free program to bring kids in from all over the city so they have an opportunity to, to play baseball. This next program is a statewide uh, program. It's run through different uh, uh, parks and rec agencies throughout the state. It's a track and field program. It's $50 program fee. We had 96 uh, participants this year, and we do have volunteer coaches from the county and the city. And we did, the kids traveled on, I don't know how many track meets, um, or track meets throughout the Southern Colorado. They went to, I think, Alamosa, Whitefield, Whitefield, Canyon City, and here. So it was a good experience for those kids to learn uh, track and field. And, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll keep coming back year after year until they start getting to high school and we're, we're developing some of those other kids. Some of our other youth, our other youth recreation programs, we do have a Sun City Marching Band, which are middle school students. Uh, we did bring it back last year. Um, it was in hiatus from COVID for two years. And the last year that we did try to register, we had three or four kids sign up. We do have assistance through Mark Emery, um, former um, county band director. He helps us with this program. He's our director for the kids. He goes out and pounds doors for us in this last year. We waived the fees so we can get the numbers back up and we had 100 this year. So uh, we're looking forward to, to bigger and better things with these kids next year. Uh, new in 23, we have a Learn to Swim program. Uh, the past eight years, the YMCA taught swim lessons at our, our city pools. Well, we have a new, well, we, he's, a, he's been with us for a year. We have a full-time aquatics coordinator now. And one of the tasks that he's been assigned is let's get our swim program, our Learn to Swim program back in the city pools. So we'll have a new program, Learn to Swim, uh, this summer at our pools. So we're bringing that back. It's a $40 program fee. And we'll be doing registration probably in May. It'll be advertised in our program guide coming up in April. So we're, we're really excited about that. A couple of drop-in programs that we do have, you know, everybody's familiar with the rides at City Park. You know, that's been around since the 1950s. Our tickets are still 25 cents, and we go Memorial Day through Labor Day. Uh, we, we're probably one of the uh, largest hiring um, of high school students for that program. They, it's, uh, it's an awesome program for them. You know, we're going to try something new this year. We're going to do $5 wristbands. You purchase a wristband for $5 and you it's unlimited rides for that evening. We're gonna try to see how that works out. We, we, we estimated that we gave over 300,000 rides last, last summer. 
open recreation, we have four outdoor pools. We're our, our registration, we don't have a register, it's all drop in, but our our uh, admission is three to four dollars, depending on the ages, and it's half price over at Mitchell Pool. We do have a lot of um, sponsorships at our pools where we offer free days. So we'll have a, a business come in and, and pay uh, an estimate of what we would be bringing in revenue for that day. We charge them that and they, they uh, open the pool for free for the kids for that day. So we'll have uh, two or three every, every pool every, every month, it seems like. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty good program. Now we, oh, okay, hang on. There's our so all those all those programs I just talked about. Uh, they're on this chart. These are our youth sports and our recreation programs. You'll see the fees in the first column. Uh, the number of participants we had. We did do scholarships, and our actual revenue is in the far right. Uh, not the far right. Far right is expenses. That's kind of misleading because those are just direct expenses with staffing and, and uh, some costs that we could track. A lot of the indirect costs aren't involved, aren't in this, uh, like our park maintenance for, for maintaining the ball fields for us, the utilities for the lights on the ball fields, the front office counters for registering. Uh, we just so hard to, to track that, those expenses. So right now all you see up there is our direct expenses. We go to our adult programs. We do have our slow pitch softball program, which is 18 and older. We do have a co-ed and a men's program. Those fees have pretty much remained the same. They're consistent to what other uh, leagues around the area do charge. Uh, we fear that if we go too much higher, it's going to, uh, it's, it's, it's not going to, we're not going to have a good program. We're going to only have a handful of teams because softball is, is not as popular as it used to be. Kickball is a fairly new program, again, 18 and older, co-ed. Uh, this year we had 24 teams, and I think we had maybe half of that last year. So we've done really well with the adult. Adults like to play the youth sports, so they like kickball. And we don't do dodgeball yet, so that might be coming. Who knows? We do offer cornhole, which is another new program that we offer. Uh, we, we do play those. those uh, it's a two-man two man, two women teams over and we play them over at the uh, tennis courts. Um, we have a spring and a fall league, $40 per team. And again, we had 46 teams participate this last year. Tennis and pickleball. Um, again, we have an adult skills drills and with our new pickleball uh, facility, we're gonna be offering pickleball lessons this, this year. Some drop-in adult programs we do at the swimming pools with the adult, the lap swim program and the uh, aquatic fitness dance. Uh, those are very popular in the summer summertime. And we do have a Zumba program at the El Centro de Quinto Soul Center. It's a drop-in fee of $2. And there's the chart for our adult recreation and sports programs. Again, the fees on the left. And if you look at the expended on the right, Again, that does not include our, our indirect costs. We do have some concerns if, if we do not charge. Um, we feel that with no commitment from participants, there's, there is a value you know, on the fees people pay. And we have a hard time. We did offer tennis, free tennis clinics and we were anticipating full classes and it, we were lucky to have each class get, get a handful of people. One day we'd have a handful, and one day we'd have hardly any. It's just, there's no commitment um, by the registrant. You know, we have expectations that parents and guardians sign up for the programs, but at the last minute they drop out. So we have to get staffing ready. We have to have the facility scheduled. We use school district on our gyms. So we have to get those scheduled. And, and that's all dependent on our final registration numbers. And if we lose those numbers at the end, uh, we have to give those, those facilities back. And sometimes they're hard to get back uh, for us, for our programs. And with that, you know, I'll uh, see if, if you have any, we'll answer any questions you might have. Uh, Councilor Flores. Uh, I noticed that uh, your anticipated revenue uh, is much lower than it was in 2022. 
for both uh, for almost all these programs. Why, why is that so? Uh, that's 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 a tough one to answer because we're we're looking at numbers increasing. Uh, you would think the number of rev the revenue would go up as well. Um, and as I really can't I can't answer that was done during the budget process. I'm just thinking that there might have been a, a reason that somebody might not have thought that we we were going to bring in that those kind of numbers as consistently as we have them. But I'd like to um, think that like in our swimming lessons, we'll be bringing in more people than was budgeted. That's that's our goal. Uh, you know, my idea last week in bringing the subject up, it really wasn't based on the elimination of fees as so much as concerned about the national uh, environment with an increase in childhood suicides, uh, the sedentary uh, lifestyle that has occurred because of COVID over the last couple of years. Uh, obesity, all of these different things were, uh, you know, I, I was I was more concerned about getting more kids involved than I was about the, the minimal fees that you charge. It was also intended just to be for this year, and it really wasn't my idea. The, the, a lot of communities throughout the United States, including Colorado Springs, are waiving their fees, not because of participation, but because of all of these issues with young people, uh, there's, uh, I just found out today, there's, uh, uh, there's an increase in, in fighting now in middle schools and in high schools uh, that happens almost on a daily basis, including here in, in Pueblo. Uh, and I think a lot of this is, is a pent up, uh, I don't know, uh, issue uh, that our kids are just, you know, uh, need something. And so that was really my original intent was that, you know, and I'm, I'm only suggesting this as a jumpstart for this year only. And that would be where we would hold all of the recreation fees harmless, that you would still derive the revenue that you projected, but it would come out of either ARPA if it qualified. As uh, President Graham has in indicated to me that we have unspent re revenue uh, and there's a considerable amount of money there. And so, but if you think that because we provide this for one year and we waive all the fees, that you think that uh, the kids will no longer be uh, engaged, uh, that's a different discussion. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say, because like I said, we've had a similar um, situation when we did offer some free programs and the numbers weren't there. And then when you did have a minimal fee, it's it's you don't know why, but you start getting numbers and it's almost maximum. It's it's hard to say, but I wanted to bring up too, you did approve an, another full-time position for us for this year, a sports coordinator. So we're in the process right now with HR to publicize that, to get the process going so we can get that person hired. And we're expecting with that full-time person on board to help bring our our youth and our adult sports programs up to another level, which could address some of the issues that you're talking about. Just to be clear, uh, if we were to proceed, waive uh, the fees this year, you're saying that's not a good thing? We're, well, that's our opinion, Dennis. That we, we just don't feel that because of our past experience, um, not having the buy-in and the commitment of the registration, the parents, the kid might be so excited to do it, but sometimes the parents, something comes up and they, they forget, oh, we don't have the commitment. We didn't pay to bring these kids so they don't show up. You know, we're, we still have to recruit coaches. We still have to, re, you know, get the facilities. It, it's, it's something that you, you're not, you don't have a forecast on. Now, Colorado Springs, I, I did a little research on Colorado Springs. They, up to date, they've got over 300,000 in donations to pay for scholarships for their for programs. And not all their programs are completely waived. They only have a cap. They'll give 300 in the T-ball program. They'll give the first 380 kids that sign up free. After that, they have to pay. But most of it is donations. For the scholarships and we're we're we were just talking about that too and we've been talking with 
finance about set, helping us set up a scholarship program and maybe bringing in donations so that we can do that same thing. Yeah, I, I was hoping that we didn't have to bring in the scholarship uh, of family. You know, I, I think in a lot of cases, that's a detriment for families. They don't want to ask for a scholarship. So you've got, to, you've got so many other issues there. And, um, you know, if, if charging 25 cents to a ride, I think that is the opposite of what you're saying. I mean, it doesn't, I mean, there's everybody, all the kids want to go on the rides. Yeah. So that's a drop-in program. That's yeah. not a registry. You're not registering ahead of time and committing to that program. You just show up. So you think- but I, I, I see what you're saying. You're, you're thinking that there'll be a loss of commitment by the- Parents and the we have seen it. We have seen it. What about a reduction in the fees? That's uh, and, and there's a commitment there. They're making they're making a payment. We've we've seen that with our scholarships. They do show up. Yeah. They are there on our scholarships. We'll we'll charge ten dollars. You know, if we have a, a fifty-five, sixty-five dollar fee, and what can you afford? Ten dollars. That's fine. We just want to make sure we have that commitment from them. I totally agree with you. Uh, there has to be a buy-in. Uh, going back to the Art Center proposal, when I talked to them, I told them, I, mean, I understand we're going after the low-income kids, but they have to have a, a buy-in to it. So I suggested at least a $35 thing for eight weeks. Otherwise, they won't show up. And, and that's exactly, and, and it's not as if the, the kids and families that are in this program can't afford it. I mean, they could afford the, the, the fees uh, and the kids that don't and the families that don't, you let them in. You know, Our whether fees it's are, on a sliding scale or, or yeah. whether you waive all fees altogether, if somebody wants to come in, they, you guys don't turn them away. And that's what I like about the program. Um, I'd like to see a lot more participation from that lower end right. in the city programs, but by the same token, um, they don't think they belong, so they don't go. Uh, that's another story altogether. But no, uh -huh. I, 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 I'm, I'm in favor of keeping the fees just the way they are. Well, our neighboring communities look at us and kind of replicate what we're doing, you know, as far as fees, what type of programs are running. So. We're uh, we're doing something right. We've got a yeah. we've got a great program. Our team is yeah, we really do. dedicated. Yeah. yeah. Councilor Martinez Ortega. Thank you. Um, thanks for uh, putting all that information together. That's phenomenal. Um, you know, I I'm um, I think that the best way to get some of the folks from the lower income neighborhoods to participate in some of these programs that were always seem to have some of those barriers, like whether it's money or whether it's even asking for the scholarships. Um, I remember being in similar situations, uh, playing football that I think was registered through um, Parks and Rec. Um, but I, uh, I think that if we, I mean, fact of the matter is we really don't know. It sounds like if nobody's gonna show up, if we make it for free, um, but maybe if there's a, uh, an option of donate uh, donate the registration. So then they still do have a little buy-in, but to reduce all barriers, all monetary barriers, I think is phenomenal. Uh, it's a great idea just for this year. And even if it's part of how we're delivering that message of like, this year is free only. This year only is free. So then they can maybe like value that a little bit more. Um, but I'm in favor of um, reducing all those programs uh, fees to nothing uh, because teen suicide and uh, things like that, just getting kids more active is um, has to be a priority this year. Anybody else? Councilor Maestri? Well, you, bought, you, you said bottom line, no child is turned away yeah. under the current program. So I, you know, and if it works for the par Parks and Rec to function properly so that we can continue to stay whole and um, progress, then no child is turn, has been turned away. I don't know if term free is going to make the difference in the teen suicide, child suicide rate, because we are second in the nation, the state of Colorado, unfortunately. But we are also legalized uh, marijuana, and we 
concentrates in marijuana are now statistically proving um, to cause psychosis in children. And we've got that problem. It's proven. How, uh, how do, how would one go about getting on a scholarship to be able to participate? Because I mean, although the fees are not a lot, if you have four children, that could, that could get expensive. And so do they come to Parks and Rec? Is there something they fill out or how does that look? Right. Like? Usually they come in and, you know, they'll express that they have, you know, to ask us if we have a, um, a rate for families or, and the ladies up front are trained to, to give them a scholarship application and say, Hey, just fill this out. You know, just, you got to make them fill something out. I mean, it's just, you got to have some information down and then just tell them, you know, we'll, whatever you can pay, we'll get your kids signed up. But you know, the, the kids get signed up no matter what we'll get them in there. Yeah, that's really true. Uh, the psychology of it all, and really the middle income families, they don't want to go to a free program. The only, what ends up happening is they end up, those families end up going to the club programs and they'll uh, go away from city sponsored programs. And uh, you, you, you'll lose more people than you get. You might think you're going to get lower income kids to go, but uh, you get very few of those kids anyway. And the we, ones that you do get, they, you know, you don't turn them away. So. Our, our experience with the competitive teams, they, they'll come in and, at a, you know, at the low rate that we charge as it is, and they'll just use our league as a practice. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes they'll, if they got a tournament some weekend on a Saturday, they won't even show up. Yeah, that's true. So we, you know, we have to make do. Yeah. 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 Uh, you got you to gotta have that buy-in. Councilor Flores. Yeah, if you look, uh, you know, because I, I looked at COVID a lot broader than just recreating kids. Uh, it is amazing how much money adults took in this situation where they're paying no fees. They, uh, I mean, there's so many people that committed fraud uh, in the United States, but uh, the amount of money that the federal government gave to propping up businesses just astronomical and whether they needed it or not. So, uh, you know, I, I didn't think this was gonna be an issue. It caught me off guard because uh, all I was gonna really ask for is a thousand dollars, thinking more focused on obesity, sedentary lifestyle, getting kids out in the open and out of the basement, you know. That was really my original foundation and thought but if 100,000 to help our kids is, is gonna be a detriment, it's like maybe I've lost that vote. You, you think about all the money uh, that businesses took uh, uh, and, and many of them legitimately because they were trying to prop up their, their businesses and also pay them. There, there, in no way did that deter them from taking the money. They were going to uh, somehow not show up. And, and uh, you know, I, I still think uh, waiving the fees for one year, uh, I don't know, it would also be an experiment, I guess. But uh, I, I do get your point. You know, there's uh, in life, sometimes there's no value in things that have uh, no buy-in from people. And But that was my original idea. My intent always was good. Uh, but I, I want you to contrast what I've asked for and uh, what the feds did uh, to the rest of society. Councilor Winner. <clears throat> yeah, um, I have quite a few friends that are doctors and quite a few friends that are dentists. And um, unfortunately, um, some of them don't take Medicaid because there's, uh, there's, I mean, they don't show up for the appointments. So again, you just don't have that, that value of time that you're scheduling. You know what I mean? So there does have to be, I mean, it's a problem in the health industry. Um, where you have so many people canceling with free health care that a doctor won't accept it anymore because it's blocking up that time. So, I, I mean, I get it. I get it. It's, it's, it's a problem. Or one way to look at that is if somebody is on Medicaid or it has to um, use a free program, 
then maybe they have more life obstacles that come in the way that may prohibit some of the the fun stuff or oh eye exam I don't need to go to that right now um, things like that and so I think we have to start looking at um, those folks who are living in those um, de- impoverished um, brackets um, a little bit differently rather than saying they're not valuing your time a little bit more. Um, it's how are we meeting them um, to get them to participate in some of the stuff that we want them to, to not be obese, to not have to succumb to um, depression and taking their lives or what have you. I, I agree with both Dennis and uh, Mr. Ortega, but that's another program altogether. How do we reach that, that part of the society? Because the kids that are going to recreation programs uh, are little athletes anyway. You know, they're participating because they want to participate. The kids that are sedentary, the kids that are at home, not doing anything that aren't athletic and don't participate. If you want to reach those kids, that's another issue altogether. That's another thing. I, I just wanted to thank you. I mean, it was amazing how fast you put this together. But I, I think there is a, a good a good story here from your data. We're providing we're providing close to two thousand kids in our community with great recreational facilities and programs. And it's, it's uh, running us less than $100,000. That's amazing. I would say that probably no other city uh, in the state of Colorado that's doing what we're doing uh, with that kind of money. It's, it's not a whole lot. And in fact, that is significant, uh, a significant benefit our citizens get. That's a lot, a lot of participation for that, account of, that kind of money. So there is a good story here in, in your report, and I really appreciate it. It's valuable information. So thank you, Mike. Um, I, have one, I have one. Go ahead. It's okay. You know, it'd be nice to see an investment in some rec centers. Um, just having an open door for a child to cross the threshold and come into my mom, you know, my mother, uh, that was her forte and her. Um, career. Uh, She had an open clubhouse where the kids could come into um, with no expectations, just to feel at home, just to tell their story, just to have peers around them. And that would be a nice to be able to open up a facility like that, where you have an open door policy, and yet you have expectations. You know, there are rules and there are things. And so um, I've seen that work real well in the community that I was raised with, raised in. And so we just, we've got, gotten away from that. And I think it would be nice to, to really, for Pueblo to invest in reopening some of their rec centers. Absolutely. El Centro is open mm-hmm. um, and it is free and welcomes yeah, all okay. ages. So yeah, you know, I'm, there are rules there. There are expectations, yeah. mm-hmm. but it is free. And we open. put a good um, investment in that with ARPA mm-hmm. funds. I think we have what a, a million. I don't know if they've started the yeah for the, a basement yeah. Yeah. yeah remodel. And so if we had something maybe on another side of town, um, not just on the east side, but maybe open the doors somewhere else. Absolutely. That is, a, I've seen that. Uh, work really well in communities and especially you know we're a community where there's just extreme addiction drug addiction and for children it's a good place to go to to kind of escape that and um you know fellowship among uh, other children that are experiencing the same thing Mm -hmm. right that's our winner yeah speaking of overweight and obese children have you ever thought of having just a program for for that category so they can support each other? Maybe one girl's um, class and one boy's class with a nutritionist and exercise. Have you thought about doing anything like that? Do any cities do that? I'm sure they do. A lot of them have their own, have, you know, the rec centers, but we have El Centro. It's something that we can probably look at doing as far as a program over there. because That way there's no intimidation and they can kind of, I don't know. Right. Seems to work with adults. Um, I had questions about pickleball. So uh, are you going to have um, 
pickleball paddles and balls of, of, available at City Park for them to pick up? Maybe they have to leave their license or something. Take this one. <laughs> we have paddles um, available to check out. And that'll be over at City Park. I'm, I'm sorry, a, not we have Middle Palace the Park. Office, if, yeah. Well, what about Is just having available? it available there at Middle Palace Park where you can walk over and get it? And, and like I said, they could leave their license. I mean, I know that's not that expensive. The paddle, you know, the yeah, and maybe some amateur stuff is the... pretty cheap. But if you could set that up, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah, maybe um, through the pool facility because we don't through really the pool have facility, a facility exactly. Facility and if you have an ID, they're going to bring it back. Right. Do you have any plans for any kind of tournaments, pickleball tournaments, or does the association in town have it? Because this is huge. Yeah, right now we're working um, on planning our summer programs, so that's in the works. Okay, good. Glad to hear it. Mm -hmm. Would it be <clears throat> possible to maybe set aside some of? <clears throat> you know, a small amount of money for scholarships um, for underprivileged kids through ARPA funds and put the word out, um, maybe in a flyer form or in some kind of campaign to run through, you know, Boys and Girls Club. And, um, you know, kids could take it home to their parents and say, you know, I could participate in this for free and it could possibly drive the, the attendance um, of different families and Parks and Rec wouldn't be out money because we would give you guys some some ARPA funds and, and kind of see just if there is a need for that to to get that out more in the underprivileged parts of Pueblo. That need is being uh, covered by La Gente Police Athletic League. Um, I think there's another group in town, soccer group that's doing that. Uh, uh, you want if you want to drain those programs and put the kids into this one, I suppose you could do that. But uh, you know the, the 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 kids that go the kids and families that go to those programs are different than the kids and families that go to this program. Um, you want to do more for low income kids. Uh, get CSAC to help out la gente once in a while. I mean, you just said that we don't do anything for low income kids, so if we could possibly put it out there. Well, we don't, you know, well, uh, CSAC to be able to didn't give a cent to this year. This, this could we, be a way for us to And do we that. don't do anything, you know, we, we, we do get La Gente teams and participants in our programs. Oh, they support, uh, yeah. Parks and Rec supports La Gente 110%. I gotta get, yeah, I gotta give you a lot of credit. And Boys and Girls Club too. We we just signed up a whole two two teams for Boys and Girls Club in, yeah. in our, in our uh, competitive league. Yeah, I, I got to give you kudos for that because you, uh, th there isn't anything that La Gente asks for that the Parks and Rec doesn't help out with. You guys are really good with that. So in terms of uh, Parks and Rec helping out lower income kids, they're doing a heck of a job there, especially. And everybody else. Um, so with the scholarship program you have in place, you have the funds to not turn children away, correct? Well, right now we just, we discount it. We don't have any funds that we put back into the kitty. I don't think Alex wants to hear that, but oh, that's the way it is set up now. We'd like to change it. So we do have donations or corporate sponsors that we can put that, you know, put their money into a scholarship so they can be recognized that way. And that's something that we're working on now. I mean, Colorado Springs has Comcast as one of their sponsors. Um, and there's a couple other uh, businesses, but also a bunch of foundations. So they got a lot of support for their scholarship program. Yeah, because in that way, it's sustainable past just the ARPA money. Mm -hmm. And we currently don't market it as broad as we probably could, um, to your point. That it's The word's not out. It's more word of mouth than if they come in not being able to afford the program. So... Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, thank you for your presentation. And our last item tonight is our ARPA status update. Mayor Gratishar and Chief Solano. Yeah, Laura Solano and um, Alex will take this. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President, Council, and Mayor Gratishar. Uh, you have the slide deck in front of you and the other two handouts. 
but we will be um, speaking from the, the slide deck, at least this evening, unless you have questions about um, any specific item. Um, how, how we'll run through this is we'll start with um, some general information, move over to uh, the financial information from both 22 and 23 in cumulative spend and uh, remaining balances. And then circle back um, to for an update on um, the Saul Small Business um, Census Track uh, Grant Program. I can have an update for that. A co create um, update. Um, President Graham asked for that information, and I can refer you there. And then we'll conclude um, with um, uh, an update on the ARPA Million Dollar Trash Program, and we'll switch presenters there. Um, for um, at that time with a, with a separate, um, I think, um, uh, PowerPoint presentation, and then any other questions that you have. Um, so just to um, start out, um, will you drive one of you over there? The slide deck, I think, is being loaded. Loading. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're trying to figure the jeopardy? I couldn't remember. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we, you've got it in front of you, so we'll, we'll go ahead and move forward. Um, just some background. Our ARPA award was $36,407,001, as it turned out. The tranche one was received um, half of it on May the 11th of 2021. And the second, of course, was received in 2022, a little, a little later than the one year out on June the 7th of 2022. And just a reminder that the, uh, the Treasury regulations require that we obligate funds by December 31st of 2024. So that's all the way through next year. And that funds are expended uh, by December the 31st of 2026. And, a, and as a reminder on the next slide of the uses approved um, by the Treasury regulations uh, to replace a lost public sector revenue to respond to the far reaching public health and negative economic impact to provide um, premium pay for essential workers and to invest in water sewer and broadband infrastructure. And as a reminder of Oh, you're this uh, this PowerPoint slide. Okay, that's what I didn't thought. And then everybody's looking at this. So oh, everybody went directly to the numbers then. Okay. Yeah, which are included in both. They're duplicated. Right. Together. I just, I, you know. Thanks. With everyone. Thanks for for letting me know Thanks that so they much. weren't on that they weren't on on I'm board there. On your slide deck, what page? <laughs> I am on page number four now. Okay. Thanks. So we're still pulling this up. And just as a reminder and for confirmation, uh, the city is required to submit uh, quarterly reports uh, to the Treasury Department <laughs> and um, the Finance Department and under Catherine's preparation uh, detail. We are on track and timely in all files and all pre presentation reports. They are first quarter, second quarter, <laughs> third quarter. Uh, the due dates are um, covered there. Um, and the due date of January 31st is the next one. So no one will be bothering Catherine in the next week as she uh, delves deeply into preparing uh, the, uh, the next quarterly updated report. Um, she, she takes what you uh, approve and what the subrecipient agreements that are signed for and what the reports that come in from the individual awardees and converts them to submit um, our report in the following categories. She has to submit by these categories only. So public health, negative economic impact, the negative economic impact public sector, uh, premium pay, water, sewer, and broadband, and revenue replacement. So she works the accounting magic to, magic to convert uh, to the report that is accepted. It is a, um, she can talk about the report, but it's actually a fill in the blank and it won't, it won't turn green, it stays red until they are satisfied that she has submitted the accurate information in the right box. Um, and now they, of course, they've had the full year of, of, of timely reporting. So we still have, uh, still are on track and report regularly. Um, the next slide on page number five is a cumulative um, uh, listing of all 88 projects that council has approved to 56 different organizations since June of 2021. And they are listed there alphabetically. 
Um, so uh, this is the type of information that um, uh, will be media inquiries, um, how many organizations receive the funds and who were they. Um, page number five is a quick glance at the 88 projects um, to the 56 organizations. And the next slide, before I turn it over to Alex, and she talks about money, um, the ARPA projects by our internal pillar uh, review are um, listed there by individuals and household assistance, 21 projects, revenue replacement, 20 projects, youth projects, 15, tourism and hospitality, nine, community resilience, seven, our infrastructure projects, five, five awards to the nonprofit sector, uh, four to the small business sector, and um, two administratively. And the next slide speaks to um, the total award cumulative since we received our ARPA dollars now at uh, $25,656,110.15. And the dollars are listed there by the same internal uh, pillar categories. And um, they are cross-footed and ticked out and uh, they all tie to the same $25,600,000 figure. And I'll turn it over to Alex to, and uh, Catherine to talk about disbursements and, uh, and projects. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So I will go over the financial aspect. So I'm gonna go through the rest of the slides and then I'll go ahead and explain the other two documents that you received. So this next slide is really our summary page and it's looking at the disbursement summary. And I do wanna note that these are preliminary figures. So this is as of December 31st, 2022, but we did our internal cutoff on January 6th to do this reporting. So there will be differences when we get to the end of our audit and our ACFR, but we are keeping everything consistent as of a preliminary figure and that was so that we can show exactly this is what we had at this point, knowing that we are still going to have some invoices that are coming in, some more disbursements that are going to be going out, but so that we have that consistency until we've gone through the audit on this. So you'll see on the top section here, we have the community projects. And so we have each round listed, the award amount that was under each of those rounds, how much of that has been distributed by the end of the year, what that percentage is and how much is remaining in each of those rounds. And so all these figures tie to the detail that are in the two PDF spreadsheets that you received and then also in the slides that are further in this presentation. Um, so then we had the rounds one, two, three, and four, and then we had those items that were since June 1st, 2022. So the subtotal of the community projects was $15,656,110.15. As of December 31st, 2022, when we did our cutoff, we were at 53% distributed. Then the next section is our revenue replacement. So that was $10 million. And of that, we have just over 8 million, 8.1 that we had done towards government services and an unspent amount of 1.8 million. We have used 14% of the 10 million thus far as of December 31st. So the total amount awarded was $25,656,110.15. Of that 29% has been distributed. And so we have just over $18 million left to be distributed. These next couple of slides, they are gonna be the same slides that you saw when this presentation was done in June. They have just been updated that top will say that we have the amount of the award. That's gonna be the same that you saw before. Then the distributed has been updated to the end of the year. Same with the percentage and the amount remaining. I do wanna note that at the bottom of each of these slides for the rounds and the detail information, we have put a link to where those ordinances and resolutions can be found. So you can go back and see each of those. And we have the resolution and ordinance that corresponds with each of the project on the left side there. So I'm not gonna go through this detail because these aren't anything that's new to you. So the round one, this just shows the amount that was first awarded through round one. 
Here's the same for round two. So the only update here would be any additional expenditures that have taken place and since um, the presentation in June till December. This is round three, round four. So all of these were presented in June. The new section is gonna be where we're at slide 14, resolutions or ordinances passed by city council since June 1st. So these are all those that are within the last six months. And so again, we have each of the project names there, what the ordinance and the resolution number was, the amount that was awarded and what amount has been expensed through the end of the year. And that continues on to slide 15, that shows the total amount of this last section that's new to your presentation tonight of 7.556 million. The next slide is also one that you would have seen just with updates. So the revenue replacement, there are the changes to some of the amounts uh, awarded because we have had some of those where the fire pumper was a different cost or the IT software. There, there's been a few changes on there and you can see that through um, the resolution numbers, how some of them have two numbers in there. And so some of these have been updated as we've gone through the process to see what the exact amount was gonna be, for instance, on the dump trucks. So these have been updated on the revenue replacement, same onto the next page showing all the amounts and then the unspent revenue replacement of 1.8 million. Then the last slide here is a summary, but shown in a little bit different way. And this one also includes the CSAFE interest. So these funds are sitting in our CSAFE account, which to date has earned interest of $490,857.28. So almost $500,000 that we are able to then put out as ARPA funds in addition to what we received from the federal government. So our community funds in total is going to be almost 27 million at 26 million eight hundred ninety seven thousand eight hundred fifty eight dollars and twenty eight cents. Of that, we have had funded awards of fifteen point four million. The showing of administrative costs, which included payroll, clothing for unhoused students, ARPA startup, et cetera, for one hundred ninety six thousand. So the total amount remaining for community ARPA funds is $11,241,748.13. The revenue replacement, that figure is carrying forward. So it has that $1.865 million that is still unspent. Now I will take just a moment to explain the two other documents that you had. So it's the same information, it's just presented in a different format. And so the first one that is not colorful is gonna be the revenue replacement. And so this is just showing again, all the different projects underneath each of the revenue replacements that were approved. And then on the other one, the ARPA fund status that's color coordinated, this one shows exactly what makes up each of the different rounds. And so if you went through and you were to look at the different colors, they do correspond again back to the PowerPoint presentation. So it's the exact same information, just a different way of presenting it and something that's a little bit easier for you to have access to, to just grab and see quickly those figures. So that is the end of our presentation on the financial aspect. If there are any questions, I will certainly take those now. Any questions? I did have one question. Um, so on this color coded page, mm -hmm. when we're looking at the summer reading challenge first and second year, why wasn't their first year spent completely down before we gave them their second year? And how will we go about what's the reason for that? So I can speak to this one very specifically. Um, so what it was is when we did the second year, we went ahead and drew against that internally, but really it's the same pool of money. And so once they get to the point that they have 
expended and they've requested reimbursement for the 328,500, then we will draw against the remaining balance from the year one. But really that doesn't make a difference. It's just when we did the reporting, we just put it towards the second year, but it, it's that same pool of money. So it's in total the $828,500. Thank you. Nice. Councilor Martinez Ortega. Thank you. Um, just above that on the same page, um, there's two resolutions that are the same exact resolution of 2 million and 1 million. And in the in the legend, it says uh, that one, the first 2 million is in round one and the other is since 6122. Can you explain that to me a little bit? Yes, so that first one that was done at the beginning in round one, and then we did the additional million dollars. I believe that was just a month or two ago that we talked about that. So I went ahead and split that so you could see that in round one, we did have the two million and then we did an additional one million. And so that's why these these uh, the worksheets and the presentation, they have the same amounts in there, but this is presented a little bit differently. So you could see exactly when each part was done by round. So I intentionally did that so that you would see that we did the 2 million and then the 1 million. I, I do remember that. And thanks for explaining that the way you did. Thanks. But, but these have two, these were two different resolutions, but they have the same resolution number on them. Yeah, I think we, um, there was a typo there. Okay. okay. All right. All right. And we so can were update that. I think that's what you were asking, right? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. We will make yeah. Uh, the gateway arches. Mm -hmm. Is that the gateway arches up on North uh, Pueblo on I-25? No. <laughs> These are the neighborhood gateway arches. Money's been set oh, aside okay. for that. I, for the I, east side, for Bessemer, for... Oh, okay. Uh, Okay. Union Avenue. Yeah, because I passed by there the other day going up north and I figured these things haven't been built yet. And that was private money, from what I understood. And when I saw the 750000 I just got an update on that we today. This, this spring and summer, that second structure will go up, they tell me. Let's hope. Well, they're working with CDOT and CDOT has a construction program up there and CDOT's been reluctant to give them access to the right of way or enough right of way to get this project done safely. So hopefully they have those details worked out and they tell me the spring. Okay. Yeah. I, it just jumped out at me because I had passed through it and I said, well, why isn't this thing done? And now I had a chance to ask. Absolutely. So I'm glad to hear it's not the same. We're not paying for this thing twice. And I will show you, so um, that information is on this schedule. It does show the two Northern, two Union and the one. Yeah. yeah. So that way you do have that information for which ones are included on that. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, Mr. Mayor, is that gonna be like those arches we saw in San Diego? Downtown, remember? Those were nice ones, weren't they, huh? They were, up. yeah, something you know, like they that. They haven't really been designed yet. And you know, I, I, so we're-, we're Same still kind working, of concept though? We're working on that kind of process. Yeah, yeah sort right. of a wel welcome on each end of the neighborhood or on the entrances to the neighborhood. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. Yes. Same no, kind I, of, no, that's great. Same kind of thing. Love the idea. I think that's it. Thank you for color coordinating and giving us everything that we need so it's easier for us to look it up. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President and Council. Um, we, I'll send those electronically in case you prefer an electronic copy. It is easier to send questions back or um, to schedule a deeper dive at a um, at the work retreat on any one project. Um, a, a couple of updates um, on specific uh, awards. Um, you don't see the amount of the Small Business Census Track Grant Program. As Alex said, these um, uh, this. Financial information uh, was as of 1 6, and uh, council approved that on uh, Monday, 1 13. But the update that's a really cool to uh, tone. Uh, the update is that the letters were ready to go out, you know, the week before uh, council approved. And so once you approved uh, that uh, the use of those funds last Monday, um, letters went out immediately on Tuesday, um, offering a um, opportunity for small businesses to get back. How about just the volume down? Thank you. 
There you go. Um, and we've already wanted to report that the due date for in responding uh, for acceptance of the grant is February the 3rd. So there's still a couple of weeks out for all small business some offers. But um, Catherine has received, since she mailed those out a week ago, 17 replies to accept the grant. Already working on uh, the specific um, identification numbers that are needed. And um, she, she didn't have a listing tonight of what, what amounts or who they were. But 17 replies in less than a week is, is, is a pretty good rate of reply. Uh, the second item that uh, uh, President Graham asked me to look at and to report on is actually co-create. Co-create um, is working on our broadband um, projects, and um, they um, had a postponed work session, what I think prompted the question. And if you look on page nine of the PowerPoint slide deck, and recall, it is the one, two, third item down on page nine. I, uh, if you recall, council approved $100,000 um, for them to do the work that they were um, engaged to do in their subrecipient agreement. Um, to date, they have submitted invoices for 53,617, which is 57% of the total and have a remaining 46,382. And I won't steal any of their thunder because they are coming to report the first Monday is a full work session. The first Monday of February is a full work session, but I can can tell you what they've been up to um, briefly is um, developing uh, the Pueblo Opportunity Project Alliance and submitting the outlines of um, inclusion from hospitals and school districts and, and the uh, uh, institution of higher learning and K through 12 in uh, recognizing and communicating what they will be involved in with broadband. Um, they were instrumental in bringing the Colorado Broadband Office uh, for two presentations, I think, on November the 14th. And I, I believe all of you received that slide deck. Or I'm thinking they've invited a member from the Colorado Broadband Office to join them on their work session presentation. And then the reason for the postponement is um, uh, Mr. Acuna had been out of state in Mexico, out of the country for three weeks during the holidays. But while they were gone uh, working with our grant writer, uh, we submitted a, a, a grant for two year grant uh, for outreach in the affordable connectivity grant um, to the federal government that was in the IAJA um, um, infrastructure bill. It's $352,200 grant. In we named it the Pueblo Broadband Aura Project. It comes with staffing that will be called digital navigators, and they will be out working in communities uh, through task force and presentation town halls uh, to um, introduce and obtain the discounted um, um, internet access. Um, and they can also then talk about, you know, what middle mile or connectivity barriers there are and then use. I think use is also a potential barrier that they will be talking about utilizing. So to say more than that, I'm going to need the two that worked um, on specifically on the grant. It was submitted um, on January the 9th, just uh, two weeks ago. Two days later, we received an update that had already been assigned to the national reviewers. So it's looking like broadband money can be going through this grant process pretty quickly. Um, so that's the update on co-create as of tonight. And one more, and that's the last update on, on the ARPA trash program, and that will include an update from Mike on uh, where we are with staffing and scheduling and supplies, and, and then the second part is a switch over to answer your questions about safety, and uh, we'll hand that off to Andrew and uh, Marissa's here from HR for the connectivity with training. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Laura. I'd like to introduce uh, Barbara Alphen as our trash removal coordinator. She's in the back of the room. She was our temp uh, volunteer coordinator for Parks and Rec for many years, and we're looking forward to, to a lot of great things from her. Uh, she has interviewed nine applicants so far, and I think she's got five more coming up. We haven't had a, a lot of applicants, but we're still, they're still coming in one at a time. So she's interviewing, and she's got six hired, Six hired right now. Our first cleanup was today, she informed me, the QCT area east of the Fountain Creek behind El Centro between 4th and 8th, right? Right? Uh, no. That's what Stephen told me. <laughs> what did what it was your actual cleanup? Um, myself and my uh, I've been down um, on the south. 
Um, Barbara, do you want to come down here so we can hear you a little better? Thank you. And while she's coming down, we did purchase a small van from the transit department. We don't have our pickups yet. So we, we purchased a small van that will take our crews around to the different cleanup areas. And uh, we have that yet? We don't have that yet, do we? I believe it's a fleet. It's a fleet getting ready. So, so today we went out, um, it was down on the, on the Fountain River um, between um, University and I forget the other street, but um, we took out a camp. Actually, there was two. There was one behind the other. We found um, 10 needles, uh, five carts. We pulled out three, four tires. Um, it took us about, well, it's just two of us right now because everybody's in the hiring process. And it took us about two and a half hours to do it, for just two of us. Um, with that, it, it takes several trips back and forth because we can't put the carts in with the trash and we can't put the tires in with the carts. So we have to keep going back for everything. So that's what's more time consuming. And our trash truck is on order. I was, Sam from Fleet told us we might not get it until August. So um, we'll just make do the best we can until then. We do have a trailer coming um, on order. So we'll, we'll get that hooked up and um, more staff and Barbara will be on our way. So with that, that's our report. Are there any questions from council? Council Winner. So I know in the past there was some talk about purchasing an incinerator that you can put on site and everything goes in there and just burns. I'll have to talk to Stephen about that. I don't mm -hmm. remember that discussion. There was actually an entire presentation on it in in uh, not here in council, but um, at the uh, city planning and zoning there with the folks that um, sell that equipment. We'll look into it. Okay, because it's uh, yeah. Okay, thanks, Councilor Flores. Yeah, when you when uh, do, do you have the proper gloves when you have to pick up those needles? Yeah. Needles. Please. Um, we do have the proper gloves. We have the proper all, all your gear. But normally, um, the way I work with them, we don't touch a needle. We never pick it up with a glove. We always, I always use a grabber. I have my sharps container. Needle point down goes into the into the container. I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. We, we have a written process on how to pick up needles through the Parks and Rec through the volunteers. Cleanups with Barbara, and anytime we came across a needle, she has a flag and drops it, and then makes sure all the volunteers know not to to stay clear. And then she goes back and picks it up herself. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. And while we transition staff um, and ask Andrew to come up, and he does have a slide deck, the update with respect to the third party payer um, that can pay day labor, uh, that RFP is complete by finance and is sitting in purchasing and ready to, to roll out. All right, Madam President, members of council, uh, this presentation is a brief overview of our contaminated sharps program. You were just a little snippet of it there from Barbara on, on her procedures specifically. Uh, obviously, we have similar activities that go on in different departments, so I'm going to talk uh, broadly about what it is that we do and try to answer any questions uh, that you might have regarding the program. Um, so... Real quick, we're going to talk about the uh, how we are exposed, uh, what those health risks are to us uh, in, in terms of exposure to sharps, uh, the applicable standards, uh, how we mitigate the risk to our employees, uh, injury protocol in case something does happen, and then answer any questions you might have. So again, our exposure to sharps comes primarily through our uh, work activities doing roadside cleanups or in the cleanup of homeless encampments. Uh, the needles that we encounter are the primary form of sharps, but there are blades, there's broken glass, or other things out there as well. So 
three real components, main components to our program. Uh, the, the first part of it really is in our uh, how we start the day. Any day that we're doing cleanup activities, uh, we start that day with a safety brief. We talk about uh, identification of needles, proper handling and disposal, and then any injury reporting procedures that might apply if, uh, if someone is stuck. Uh, again, these are we're not doing these in public works every day. So these are safety briefs that we give on the day of our uh, activity to make sure that that information is fresh for the employees that are working. Um, we try to avoid handling or touching needles as much as we can. Uh, that was the gist of the front end loader and the dumpster up there. We typically, as we're cleaning up encampments, we uh, use our equipment to try to get rid of um, all of the elements that we're picking up and cleaning up. Frequently needles do make it from those encampments and blankets and bedding and other things into the dumpster there. So we avoid touching them altogether. When they're not avoid or when they're not um, collected in that manner, we do have to do hand cleanup. Uh, Barbara highlighted it perfectly. We use uh, our grabbers, we have gloves, we have PPE, uh, but we also have sharps containers or, or uh, containers that will be marked as sharps and disposed of uh, through access point. In case anybody is injured, there is a really um, straightforward protocol. So immediately wash hands. Uh, we are treating wounds to the extent that they need to be treated. If there's any gashes or cuts or anything like that, uh, report the incident to a supervisor and then seeking a medical treatment to follow on from that. So the risks primarily in terms of needles and uh, sharps exposures come in the form of bloodborne pathogens primarily. That's the primary risk to us here. So there are three diseases that we re really worry about. Uh, HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C are the primary ones uh, that are uh, of, of greatest concern. Uh, secondarily, tetanus from, from uh, puncture wounds to, with metal, and then to some limited extent, illicit drug exposure, right? These are needles that had likely had some kind of illicit drug in them. And so making sure that our employees are not exposed to that is also important. Uh, most of the time, the syringes that we find are empty. There's very limited uh, evidence of any kind of residue in them. Uh, oftentimes, we find them at a time where they've been out and exposed in the sun for weeks. Uh, so there's, generally speaking, uh, a lower risk of exposure to bloodborne pathogens and this illicit drug uh, potential there as well. Um, so we do have some applicable standards that we rely on for guidance about how we establish our program. Uh, 29 CFR is an OSHA regulation related to industrial safety, uh, commercial safety. There's a section in there about bloodborne pathogen exposures. Uh, so we align our protocols with that. We also have within our general regulations in the city, a safety general regulation that we follow. And there's always CDC guidance. Uh, a lot of that applies to uh, occupational exposures for healthcare workers, but some of those are certainly transferable to the work that we're doing in the right of way. So say someone is um, stuck, what happens? Uh, that, that seek a medical treatment portion that we just talked about earlier kind of leads into these steps here. Um, employees that are, uh, uh, I guess, receive a puncture wound would go and receive a health screening. Generally speaking, they're evaluated by the physician who is going to determine the, the slate of appropriate steps, but generally they follow something like this. Uh, evaluation of their current immunization status with respect to the bloodborne pathogens we just talked about or other factors. Um, if they have any information on the source, if the needle that, is, that stuck them is available, they'd like to see that. Uh, any treatment of wounds that needs to be done. Uh, there is an initial, uh, I guess, screening of uh, baseline blood uh, laboratory labs taken for uh, HIV, Hep B, and Hep C. Uh, if applicable, the provider may offer a course of post-exposure prophylaxis for uh, HIV or other, other bloodborne pathogens as well. Um, and then generally speaking, there's a long period of monitoring, just making sure that uh, nothing develops. And if something does develop, then there's a course of treatment that's developed along the way. But it's generally a six week, a three month, and a six month follow-up for screening for those three um, diseases we just talked about. In terms of vaccination, um, we offer our employees three different vaccines um, that are relevant again here. Uh, hep A, Hep B, and tetanus are the three that uh, there are vaccines for currently. But right now, there are no vaccines, obviously, for HIV and none for Hep C. 
And so those are uh, a matter of concern that you, we have to monitor and treat as, as they uh, present themselves if uh, an exposure results in an infection. And I think that's it. This time, I will take any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Is there any questions on safety protocol for Mr. Hayes? Kelsey Winner. Um, so are you going to require these employees to receive an uh, HIV test or a hepatitis test prior to camp cleanup? No, I, I wouldn't say that that's consistent with any practice in industry anywhere. Not prior to, if there's an exposure and, and they are, mm -hmm. uh, you know, potentially uh, exposed to one of the, one of the pathogens, uh, they get screened at that time. But a, a course of screening for every employee prior to is, is not something that I don't think is done anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, what about typhus? Um, typhus is um, also a potential, uh, I guess, pathogen that we can discuss as well. The three that have been primarily screened for at this point, though, were the hep A, hep B, Mm -hmm. uh, hep C, HIV. I think that was it. I think it was those four. And then you can have three. a hepatitis uh, vaccine uh, mandatory. So we can't employees. mandate employees get any vaccine, but we would certainly offer those to them. We've had employees that have declined or have been contraindicated and, and medically advised not to take certain vaccines. So, um, but certainly the risk of tetanus or the risk of uh, of infection from any of these other pathogens would certainly warrant strong consideration of getting those vaccines for employees. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Any other questions? Yeah, I just have one. Thank you. Um, so I saw like part of the PPE was um, I saw it was like a pair of like steel toe boots or something like that. Probably was something with a shank on the bottom to prevent something from going up into the sole or through the sole. Um, what if folks um, just run into like that kind of barrier? Just in terms of adequate shoes. Sure. So for our employees, uh, our folks that are page members do receive and, and I'm sorry, it's not everyone, but those that are in job or have job duties that require special footwear, there's an allowance for them. Those employees receive that and they're, they typically maintain a pair of steel-toed safety boots, uh, particularly in public works because of the work that we do. Uh, I require that for all of our streets, traffic, stormwater employees. Um, that's, that's, that comes out of that uh, allowance that they get every year. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions, Council Runner? So do you require that with your volunteers? So in terms of volunteers, we are not typically going to areas where we expect to encounter, uh, I guess, like the homeless encampments, right? Um, the cleanup yesterday, for instance, was a, was a uh, pretty controlled environment, uh, mostly trash and litter. Uh, there was a pre-screening to make sure that we weren't going to encounter any needles or, or uh, put our volunteers into a hazardous condition. Um, we did a safety briefing again, just like I do for my employees, talking to them about the identification of needles, uh, what to do if there was a hazard encountered, uh, basically leave it alone, point it out to a city employee. Um, so no, we don't provide footwear specifically for them, but typically we advise those folks in advance to come prepared to walk, bring clothes toe shoes. Um, but again, we try to minimize the risk for any volunteers that are out there as well. I would assume that any community member wanting to volunteer knows the rest that they're going to be taking before they even and, show up to a trash cleanup. And it's also not that we don't provide any PPE. We do provide the gloves. We brought uh, buckets and bags and, and uh, grabbers as well for the volunteers to use as well, just to make sure that they were safe. Thank you. Anything Thank you. else? No. The cleanup yesterday was quite successful. We had about 30, 40 volunteers about stop yeah. and, and clean up and we got Central Plaza and Parking garage and all those all, all those areas look the good. downtown area. There's hopefully it's still remaining trashless today. So thank you, Mr. Hayes. Is that the conclusion of ARPA? Okay, if there's no further business, I if you had questions for HR, Marissa was here to answer. She comes. And, um, 
This is for the mayor's office. Um, somebody brought up um, the issue of paying for parking at the nature center and wondering if we were going to resolve or come to a conclusion with that. Um, they were encouraging us to um, not to charge for parking at the nature center. And so I was, uh, I wanted to advocate for them to. Yeah. I don't think, I they think, think, I don't think we said that. I think it was a nature center. I think they indicated to us that they were going to do away with that. As the way I remember it is that they wanted to do away with it, but they wanted our approval. We said, yeah, do it. So I, are they charging for parking down there now? That's, I guess, what you're asking. I don't know currently, mm -hmm. but I was still wanted to follow up to the encourage them. The last indication them. I had was that they were going to, their board was going to eliminate that parking charge. Okay, I'll follow up and I'll double check that. Thank you. Let us know if they didn't. I can Great, also thanks. confirm with them, but I can tell you that the mayor had a guest in the mayor's office today. And, and while he was out of, out of town, I visited with the individual who said, um, thank you. I was at the nature center and I didn't have to pay for parking. So that's one individual just today. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, what was your question, Council Renner? My question is, um, have we had an employee stuck with a needle and what happened? Sure. Um, we did have one employee earlier this fall that was stuck with a needle and that individual immediately went and was seen by a medical provider and went through all the baseline testing and then now is in the regimen of following up every six, three to six months. So um, there was nothing negative so far that has come from that, thank goodness. Um, I guess I would also, to put that in context, you know, Andrew and I were talking about this earlier today, and, you know, these, these types of cleanups are really not new in the sense that, you know, Public Works has been out, they do right-of-way cleanups, so these kinds of exposures happen, um, but I can tell you that in the 13 years I've been with the city, I think the number of exposures I could probably count on one hand, so I think that that demonstrates that our PPE and training is effective, um, certainly can always be improved. And we work with our partners at Hub on risk management as well. But, um, you know, we did have the one that's connected with the recent cleanups. But um, again, I think putting it in context, our, our, we've done very well and have operated as safely as possible. Councilor. It just reminded me, uh, obviously, when you, you do have an incident, whether it's a cut or a broken bone or needle, uh, we have workers' compensation that we would notify after that happened in case there is a long-term issue uh, for any individual. So they have coverage under our workers' compensation through the city. That's not a question. I was just wanting to clarify that. Any other questions? All right. Oh, wait, 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 wait. <clears throat> is there what is the reason for um, the median ordinance? Did you just want us to review this? What's going on with this? We have a work session on panhandling coming up. I believe it's next. So you just want people to review the the law that's not being governed. Uh, enforced. Yeah. Sorry. Enforced. I think it, it's part of the upcoming um, um, uh, work. Present work session presentation by the chief. Okay. And so Deputy Chief uh, Martin is here today, but this is just simply for awareness. And All right. I just wondered what it was about. Thanks. Okay. This meeting is adjourned at 757.